All right, guys. Welcome to our Live Fully Zoom. I'm super excited about tonight's topic. So thank you to everybody who has joined. And um, thank you in advance to people that are about to join and that are just running a little bit late tonight, as well as people who um, will hopefully go back and see this recording. So um, just a little bit of background before we get into the topic. Um, this is super casual, so please use the chat as you have comments and things to share because I definitely um, want to bring everyone into the conversation about this. Uh, but over the past, oh boy, um, several weeks, maybe a couple of months, I have just had an influx of phone calls from people um, who have someone in their family or maybe a friend that has had bariatric surgery and is struggling with some of the issues post-surgery, so gaining the weight back. Um, there's a lot of medical um, conditions that we won't go into in this call, but I will in a future Zoom. Um, things that have to do with absorption of vitamins and minerals and calories and iron deficiencies and anything that's related to hemoglobin and hematocrit, red blood cell count is common, um, dizziness, you know, like there's all of these things that I hear all the time and, I'm, and I just shake my head like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, because I've gone through all of them. So we're going to talk about those um, on future Zooms, you know, those specific medical conditions. But one of the things that I really wanted to talk about tonight was just the simple like regaining of the weight. Um, after bariatric surgery. So um, we're gonna do, we're gonna cover three things, okay? So, uh, and I've got some notes. Um, this is not memorized, nor is it meant to be professional. So here's what we're gonna go over. One, I'm gonna go over some really quick statistics that some of them I knew from having surgery, some of them I did not, but I think they're really, really interesting. Um, and those are quick, those will go by quick. The second thing is the why. So why are we gaining the weight back after having had this miraculous surgery where you lose all this weight and then it's like the panic sets in when you see the scale going the other direction, right? And it happens every time. I cannot even believe in, in and we'll get to like, you know, specific stories, but um, how many people that I talk to that have had some sort of bariatric surgery and that when I say bariatric surgery, um, I, there are, are several different kinds, right? My specific kind is called the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, where the duodenum is actually bypassed. Um, which is why you we don't absorb calories and nutrients in the same way, which is why you're able to lose 100 pounds in 11 months, like I did. I mean, it literally falls off 20, 30 pounds a month, like boom, boom, boom. Um, so that was the number one statistics. Number two, why are we gaining weight back? So we'll go through some of those reasons. And then the third thing is what can we do about it? Okay, there are, when I started getting into this, I was like, oh my gosh, there are just so many related topics that are gonna have to be future Zooms because there's just not gonna be enough time. But those are the things that I wanna cover tonight. So bariatric surgery can in include the RUNY gastric bypass, which will be my specific experience. So when I speak to you know, issues that I've run into, um, that's what I'm talking about is the, the ruin Y gastric bypass. There's also um, the gastric sleeve, which is a little bit different. And we have Allison on the call here who has actually had both um, the gastric bypass and the gastric sleeve. And so um, I was super excited that Allison, that you're joining too, because we'll definitely want to get your feedback and there may be some differences, you know, in what you've experienced um, with the two different surgeries. Um, and then there's also the lap band, so which is also called the um, adjustable gastric band, where people, you know, have a band around, um, is it around the esophagus or around your actual stomach that okay, your stomach that continues to get adjusted that regulates the amount of food that can go into a stomach versus having a completely new stomach created um, as in the other two that are a little bit more invasive of surgery. So that's what we're covering today. Those are the three that were are kind of included in the, in the conversation. And so um, 
but I'll be focused mostly on the gastric bypass. So um, getting into the, um, the first, you know, number one are some statistics. So I just want to rattle these off really quick just because I think it's important for people to know. And whether you're, you know, Morgan has not um, had um, gastric bypass. I see Gerald's on here has not had any type of bariatric surgery at all. Uh, Morgan, no. And uh, Leo, no, right? Your, your weight loss was all natural through isogenics? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so, and but I do know that we have many people that are in the U.S., and for you guys who just um, jumped on, um, Leon is actually, um, my friend Talina, who lives in Puerto Vallarta, is her dad, and he is dialing in from Sydney, Australia. He's actually going to guest on our Zoom um, next week, which I'm so excited. So we're actually, I'm like, Liv Foley's going global. Um, so we're going to really try to bridge countries and just talk about this severe obesity, um, you know, as it relates and impacts the world, you know, not just the U.S. So, so exciting. Um, okay. So, and then again, Allison has had, so we've got a mixture of people that have had surgery, not had surgery, but have so many people in live fully in the group that are a part of the hundred pound club, whether it's, you know, in the U S or in other countries. So, um, I think this surgery topic is, is one that's going to really touch a lot of people. Um, so one, the average weight that's lost after you've had gastric bypass surgery is about 65% of the amount of weight that you are medically, you know, considered medically overweight. So for example, if you're a hundred pounds overweight, you can estimate that you're going to lose about 65 to 70 pounds of that hundred. Okay. So that is just kind of gives you an idea that there's no, you know, when you show up at the doctor and you're like, Hey, I'm considering this surgery. How much can I expect to lose? Um, there's, you know, there's no guarantee. Everybody's different, but that's a good average is six, about 65 to 70% of, um, of the amount that you're considered to be medically overweight. About half of all gastric bypass patients regain weight after the first two years. So typically it takes a year and a half to two years to, um, to, to see a massive significant loss in weight. Um, my case, I lost 100 in about 11 months. I know some people have lost more, some less, um, but in about a year and a half is pretty typical for people to kind of plateau out after surgery. So you're going to like lose, 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 lose. And then it's going to, your body's going to kind of plateau and reset. Some people continue to lose more after that. So into year two, um, and then it gets to the point where it, it becomes less of the conditions of the surgery that's responsible for the weight and more about what you do yourself as far as healthy eating and exercise of getting the rest of the weight off. Okay. Um, and then there's an average of eight to 10, this one I laughed, um, an average of eight to 10% of the weight is, you can expect to come back so that the, the doctor will say it will be normal that after you get to your low point, so you've lost as much weight as you can, your body actually knows when to stop losing, um, which is a little scary at first. I don't know if it was for you, Allison, but it was just like, I was losing, losing, losing. And all these people around me, my family, friends, people who love me are like, stop losing weight. It's too much. And I'm like, I am not, I can't do anything. I can't, you know, it's not, I'm not doing anything um, to do it. It's just coming off because it's part of that process that's happening, happening internally. But everyone does reach a low point. And then there's an average of eight to 10% that's um, natural to come back of, of your starting weight. So for me, I started at 240 pounds. This was back in 2010 when I had my surgery. And so I'm thinking like, okay, no big deal. If I gain, you know, 20, 25 pounds back. Um, you think that's not a big deal. Like you're like, all right, well, I'll take that, you know, in, in exchange for losing a hundred. Um, but what happens is 
that, you know, you gain back your first five, then you're 10 and then it's 15 and then it's 20. And like in my mind, psychologically, I'm saying, this is normal. This is normal. The doctor said this would happen. Well, it doesn't have to happen. I mean, that's just the average, right? It happens because I wasn't concerned and focused on eating healthy. Um, and so then after that 10% came back for me, um, so again, that would be, you know, 20 pounds. It was another five and another five and another five and another five. And so to the point that now I was back up, had gained 50 more pounds back after the surgery. So what I, what started happening is I started getting all of these phone calls from people that had the exact same story. And they were like, oh my gosh, I'm gaining all this weight back. What do I do? And it's this panic. So we'll get into, you know, what do we do about it? Um, in a second. So the last statistic is um, most people who have had bariatric surgery um, keep at least 50% of the weight that they lose off um, after 10 years. So there is good news. I mean, like it's, there are people that can gain all of the weight back after surgery, but it says that um, most, of, most of the people, and I don't know what that percentage is, um, will keep at least 50% of what they lost um, off after 10 years of, of having that. So um, any comments or any ahas like with those statistics about the surgery? Patients? Other than knowing that it's like, having experienced that myself, like, it's very true what the statistics are. Yeah. I thought so too. I would, when I, when I was looking at him, I was just like, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, but okay. So the next thing then that I want to get into is why. So why are we gaining the weight back? Um, one of the things that I did not know now, when I went in for counseling, there's, there's typically a uh, period of time or a program that you have to complete before you can actually sign up and schedule bariatric surgery. So some of them are three months, some of them are six months, some of them are longer. It just depends on what hospital or what clinic you go through to have surgery. Um, mine was actually kind of a quickie one. Mine was three months. And so I went through that su support group. And um, when I was in that, what they do is they try to prepare you for what's going to happen after surgery. They prepare you with how to eat, um, what the phases will be after surgery and things to expect. Um, there's something called dumping that has to do with your, you know, digestion and kind of resisting digestion of certain foods, which basically comes out like massive, terrible cramping diarrhea. So I, there's no other way to soften it up. That's what it is. Um, and it, so they, they kind of prepare you for that. Um, some of the physical parts of the surgery, what you're going to go through, you know, during surgery and then afterwards. But one of the things that they talked about was losing weight before the surgery, right? And so when you go in for a consultation, the doctor will say, what I want you to do is try to lose 20 pounds before, you know, even when you schedule the surgery, I want you to lose 15, 20 pounds. I want you to try to lose 30. They want you to lose this weight before the surgery. Well, I never knew why why that was. Um, and so I was like, well, okay, you know, it's good. We try to, you know, go in losing weight. Well, one of the statistics is actually that um, you are more likely to keep the weight off um, and keep a lower BMI, um, which, where is that statistic? Shoot. Mm, maybe I didn't write it down. Um, yeah. Weight loss before surgery impacts how much weight you're going to lose. So people who say, I haven't lost as much weight as I wanted to, um, it's interesting that you might want to go back and be like, oh, I wonder if they tried to lose weight before the surgery. Um, because it, apparently, and I don't know if that has to do with emotionally and kind of a mindset of like, all right, I'm gearing up for the surgery to get into a healthy body. And so I'm committing myself now before the surgery versus binge eating before the surgery. So there's actually um, a clinical diagnosis that's called BED. 
bed, which is binge eating disorder. And so again, I'm like, ah, oh, we need to do a whole nother Zoom on binge eating because I can tell you the first time that I had um, applied for bariatric surgery through my insurance, I got rejected because I was about eight pounds, I think it was eight pounds short of having the BMI, so that's body mass index, which is a formula that has to do with your height and your weight. Um, but I was eight pounds short of what that uh, requirement was. So I went out and I gorged on every cheeseburger, milkshake, like every terrible high calorie, high carb thing that I could because I was so desperate to get this weight off of me. And I thought there's no way, I was 40 years old at the time, there's no way that I'm gonna be able to get all this weight off without having this massive invasive surgery. So I went out and I did the binge eating, um, 8888. Um, so interestingly, I'm one of the ones who started, you know, who gained the weight back. So when you look at that statistic, I was like, wow, did I lose weight before surgery? No, I went to town. It's like, you know, it's any, any addiction. It's like when you make that decision, um, mine, you know, moved from food to alcohol. And I'll talk about that um, in a minute when we talk about kind of what to do uh, about gaining weight because that alcohol addiction and drug addiction is a gigantic factor when it comes to, um, you know, r relative to weight loss surgery. So I thought it was just me. And then all of a sudden I started again hearing the same story, same story. So, um, so I, yeah, I did the wrong thing before surgery. I ate, um, like crazy as if it was never, I'd never be able to eat the way I wanted to again right? Um, which is absolutely not true. But um, okay, so the second reason goes right into it, alcohol and drug addiction. So um, this idea of replacing one addiction with another one. Um, I just started writing a list. For me, first it was wine. And then I realized I was drinking up to about three bottles of wine a day. Um, and it was pretty consistently, so I'd say probably seven days a week for maybe close to two and a half, three years. Um, and then realized when I was like, okay, Chris, you know, you're drinking way too much. I was not able to stop drinking. Um, and then got into AA. In the process of talking to other people that had had bariatric surgery, um, other people were saying the same thing. Like, man, I drink like crazy. And so you think about, well, I never drank that much before. And the reason is because food was the thing, right? Was the thing of the addiction. It can be food, it can be drugs, it can be wine, it can be sugar. I, I posted many months ago about how I'm trying to conquer this addiction to sugar and candy, which I'm doing better. But I would use that as a crutch. Like, well, you don't understand. I just stopped drinking wine which is sugar. And so my body is used to producing insulin in a certain kind of way. And so I'm still craving sugar. But what I wasn't admitting to myself was that that sugar addiction emotionally was the same as the addiction to wine, was the same as the addiction to food. So it's still, there's a reason why, I mean, you guys, I titled this group live fully i mean full being in capital letters because of the filling that i was doing with food um because i wasn't loving myself it, i didn't have the self-love um that i believed that i deserved to be in a healthy body and so it was food and then when i sh when i got the surgery and my stomach became this big food couldn't be the thing so it went to wine Right. And then it went, you know, from wine to sugar. So um, addressing those addictions and kind of having your mindset open to looking like as the weight, you know, if weight's coming back, what are you doing? How like what are your behaviors that maybe if it's not food, what are the other things that you could be replacing with that are still, you know, causing you to gain weight? Um, because it is possible to out eat the surgery. I mean, your stomach will stretch 
And that was one of the four warnings of the support group that I was in, is that if you start eating too much too soon, your stomach will stretch and you will out eat it. Um, I don't know, uh, Leon or um, Gerald, if either one of you guys are um, big NFL football watchers, um, but I know that there's a, Leon says no, he was like, yeah, they're probably like soccer in Australia, not football. Not your kind of football, our football. Um, football. So anyway, I know that there's a professional um, football coach who had lost, um, I don't know, 100 or 200 pounds. It was massive. And he gained it all back and then some. And so my trainer, when I said that I was going to have surgery, was like, you know, Chris, like you can gain all this weight back. And I just, I didn't believe him. I was like, there's no way you can have that surgery and have a stomach that's this big and gain it back. And here I went, you know, gaining back 50 pounds. So um, it can happen. And, and like I said, things can um, come about like, when you turn to alcohol instead of food, you can, I developed an ulcer. Again, some of those um, other medical conditions of low iron, you get really dizzy, you can't replace your blood at the same capacity that, that other people can. Um, and so it's, you know, you have to be able to look out for what those addictions are and be honest with yourself. You know, like I, I, I mean, for the long, I mean, it was years I was drinking and thought that, what do you mean it's not normal to drink three bottles of wine a day? Right? Like, I, I mean, I, and as crazy as it sounds, consciously, I didn't see that I was replacing that addiction with food, you know, with, with alcohol. And then again, you know, with sugar and candy, like, well, what's so wrong with eating cookies and candy? Everybody does that. Right? Yeah. Not like I was eating cookies and candy. So, um, that kind of leads into a support system. So we're still in the, why are we gaining weight? Okay, and so you think about when people, I've always heard a story that when people go into like drug rehab, that one of the main things that is talked about, and I've never, I've never been um, in drug rehab, but one of the things that is addressed is your support system, that it's like, great, you come in, you learn about yourself, you learn about your addiction, um, you kind of are able to move past that addiction while you're in this bubble of rehab, right? Well, then when you come back out and you're still, it's still the same family members, the same friends that you hang around, um, but you're trying to take on a completely new lifestyle, um, that can be really hard. And so gaining that weight back, I think is, um, it, that's a big part of it is who, who do you have as a support system? So in, in why does it happen? Um, you know, for me, it was really important to have supportive people around me that knew that, um, that this was something that I was trying to do. Um, uh, for instance, I would sit at the dinner table. Um, and everybody, you know, we, it might be a holiday dinner and everybody's got this gigantic plate of food and finishes it in a normal amount of time. And here I am with my, you know, half a plate of food and I'm still have all this food sitting there and I'm trying to eat more and faster because I'm trying to keep up with everyone else. Allison, you're shaking your head. Yeah. Right. Because you're like, who wants to be the one sitting there with food? Like when everyone's done and ready for dessert, I'm literally ready to go throw up. Like I, I, it's I, the, the support and it, it wasn't on purpose that they weren't supporting me, but it's the having people that have an understanding that it is going to take me three times as long to finish this food. Right? Like if I try to eat the same amount, when I try to um, or I get questioned the entire time. Don't you like that? You know, when you go to restaurants, is everything okay with your dinner? Do you not like it? I'm like, no, it's fine. I'm, you know, I'm just take, just taking my time. Um, that there's no understanding and that can kind of work on your brain too. Um, is that if you're constantly, you know, for me being single, that situation would only happen so many times a year. 
Like when I would get together for big holiday dinners, it would happen. I would overeat. I would feel miserable because I put way too much food in my stomach because I was trying to make everybody else comfortable and not have 20 questions, you know, being asked. And so, um, you know, having that support system, I think is really critical. The other, you know, besides your family and friends is there are tons of support groups. Um, so whether it's through the hospital or clinic that you um, are considering having surgery through, you can still go back to those support groups after surgery. And there were people that when I um, was going in pre-surgery for my counseling in, in the support group, there were people that had already had surgery that were coming back to that group that were talking about these very things. I'm gaining weight back. I've developed an ulcer. Now I'm addicted to something else. Um, and so those, it, it's, I didn't see it then, but I see now how important and critical it can be for, um, for us, you know, post-surgery to be able to reconnect with people that get it, that understand, you know, what's going on. Um, hospital family and friends. Okay. And the last thing on the why are we gaining weight is, um, you know, your psychological state after surgery. And so I've talked a lot about this in when I've gone live in Live Fully. Um, there was a book that I read that just talk, kind of talks about the, our past imprints and how they kind of form who we think we are. And we're not that. I mean, we are because we've gone through those experiences, but we can be a completely, you know, brand new person in a healthy body with a healthy mindset if we focus on it. But um, one thing, and Allison, I want to get your opinion on this. Um, one thing that I experienced that was not discussed in my support group um, was identity and how when you go from being 100 pounds overweight, which I was for probably 15 years, 15 to 20 years, um, like I was the fat girl with all of my friends when I went out. Like I was the one that was shopping at Lane Bryant when everybody else was shopping at Nordstrom. Um, I was the girl that didn't get talked to as much by guys because my smaller, skinnier friends got all the attention. Um, and then when I lost 100 pounds, and it was like I could buy clothes that I was never able to wear before, you know, I got different kinds of attention when I would go out, you know, to the club or whatever. I didn't know who I was. I mean, I spent 15, 20 years, like, kind of adopting this identity of who I was with the weight and then the weight wasn't there. And I was like, okay, well, who am I supposed to be now? What's your, what, did you experience that too? I did. And, um, it was, it was really hard. Um, I, and I, like for me, it was even harder because I lost the hundred pounds in nine months and my husband was deployed at the time. So not only was I trying to figure out who I was, but he was also trying to figure out the new me. And it, it was just, it was crazy. And I would go into Lane Bryant or Torrid or whatever store that I used to shop at. And I'd be like, oh, this is so cute. I'm going to buy this. And I'm like, I'm not that size anymore. Like I, I couldn't get over the fact that I was no longer that size and I was no longer a plus size. And it was really, really hard to, to figure that out. It, it took a long time. It took several friends. like no, that's not you anymore. You know, like you don't need to shop there. And yeah, it, it's tough. It's really tough. It, it's a big mind game and trying to figure out all the different everything, like emotions and everything, you know, and eating habits. And like you said, not that, you know, family and friends not understanding why you have this tiny little plate and it takes you 30, 45 minutes to eat like maybe a cup of food, you know, and, and then feel full afterwards. And it's all, it all like is really hard and takes a big toll on you. Yeah. Did yeah. you, um, did you participate in any support groups like pre-surgery or post? 
I did. Um, I had my surgery um, back in January of 2013, and it was on the Army base out in Texas, and um, they it was fairly new out there, and um, they didn't have a whole lot of requirements that we had to do. We had to go get a psychological evaluation done, and it was like you sit there for like four hours and answer hundreds of questions and and that's it and then um and then you had to go to two support group meetings and have labs done and that was it and um it was like maybe a three-month process because it took a little while to get the psyche valve back but um after the support after i you know got my surgery date it was i didn't even have time to do the pre-op diet Cause I found out like on a Thursday and I was having surgery on Monday. So there was no dieting, but they told us too, um, that the reason they have you do the, the pre-op diet to lose weight before surgery is to help reduce the, um, the fat on the liver to reduce complications from surgery. And yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting, but, um, but I, so I only went to a couple of support group meetings and then after surgery, I went to a few more and, um, but then they got real clickish, the people that were there. And so it was really hard to go back. Like there was no support at all. So, yeah. And then here I'm finding some new ones. So trying to get back to support group meetings, cause I think they're really important. I mean, there's a lot that they don't tell you about before surgery. And, you know, like you said, you go from your eating addiction to another addiction to another addiction and you don't hear about that stuff beforehand. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Well, let me know. Um, if, just so you guys know, both Allison and I live in, in the same town. So uh, let me know what those groups are. And like, I, I will be really interested in going with you because I've not been to any um, yeah. here either. Um, I didn't even know that I would need them after surgery, you know? Yeah, I didn't either. I wasn't ready for it. So, um, okay. So the last thing I want to say about the addiction, um, you know, you think about like withdrawal symptoms, right? Like when you think of, um, like alcohol addiction, drug addiction, like people go through withdrawals and I don't know if this happened with you, but, um, I saw eating as an event before surgery. I mean, I thought about it all day. I couldn't wait to like eat this special thing that I was going to have for dinner and then the ice cream that I was going to have afterwards. And it was something like that I looked forward to where I could sit down. It was truly like this, like a relationship that I had with food um, and how it made me feel so much better. And it's just going to be so good. So it was like an event. And then after surgery, um, when I wasn't able to do that, I don't know if I would go as far as to say it was depression, but if it wasn't, it was pretty doggone close because I lost that relationship that I had. Like, it was like, well, if I don't have food to make me feel better and I can't have that event of sitting down and eating, you know, all this food, like what's supposed to make me feel better now? And so I literally mourned my relationship it was like i had a breakup like i you know what i mean like i like food was my boyfriend and i broke up and it was like oh like what am i going to do now and i don't have any love now and um which sounds funny but it i mean it's it's actually what happened um and so and it was kind of a long period of time that i i would get bummed you know people would go out to dinner and i wouldn't even want to go because it would psychologically it would bum me out that I couldn't go and enjoy it the way that I used to be able to enjoy it or even the way that they did you know like food became something that like I just had to do and I had to do it a certain way and it was just for the purpose of fuel and nutrition and no longer like to make me feel good because it didn't make me feel good you know you eat too much and you feel awful <laughs> So did you experience any of that? I did. And I think I'm still like 
experiencing some of that, you know, um, I, since I have gained some of the weight back, it's kind of like a love hate kind of <laughs> relationship with food. You know, I love it so much, but then I know like I need to have that, you know, not think about it all day long and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I, I have definitely felt like that. Yeah. And, and, and like you said, almost like a, almost like a depression kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people, yeah. It's, hard, it's like, unless you've been through it, you know, it's hard to explain. Mm -hmm. like, what do you mean yeah. depressed that you can't eat food? Like, isn't that the best thing that ever happened? And it's like, no. <laughs> it's a bummer. Yep. Um, I was like, I was going to say, plus you're an amazing cook. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> for your husband and kids and you know mm -hmm. like it's even more so you mm -hmm. know where I'm single um and I don't cook you know so mm -hmm. like that experience of like having food and other people eating this amazing food around you is even you know magnified even more when you have a family yeah like, and and that was a big thing too when um Brian came back from Afghanistan um he had no idea what my eating habits were and how, you know, how I ate or anything anymore. And, and that was, he was like, are you really not going to finish that food on your plate? And you didn't even put hardly anything on there. You just need to finish it. And, and I'm like, I can't. And, and he's like, I'm not going to be your human garbage disposal. <laughs> but I like, I physically could not eat it. And so it took a while too, for him to adjust to it and see, what those habits were and how everything changed and yeah. And, and how I cook and what I cook and everything. And you don't think about it being frustrating for other people, right? No. You're the one that goes through it. Mm -hmm. yet you have all of these people, you know, going back to that, um, you know, that circle of support that you mm -hmm. have. Um, if they don't understand that literally, if I take one more bite, I will be running to the toilet. Like yes. it's coming out one end or the other. And exactly. like, you know that when it's like, well, eat, eat just a little bit more or someone, you know, even feeding you, like, it's sweet, like here, have a bite, have a bite of this, you know? And I'm like, mm -mm, like, mm -hmm. can't do it. like literally they're like, come on, mm -hmm. come on, have another bite. So yeah. Um, so that, that's difficult. The psychological, um, issues I think are major, um, mm -hmm when it comes to having people around us that understand, you know, what we've actually gone through and, and, and know that like, when I say stop, I mean, stop, like, I can't, like, can't do it. And I'm going to sit here a little bit longer than you are when we're all at the table, or I'm going to put half of my plate back in the fridge and say, I'm going to come back to that, you know, so I don't waste it. Um, sorry. So, um, Okay, so what to do about it? Um, okay, talked about that. So the support group was the number one. The number one thing is, um, is if you're not into a support group, find one, even if it's just a group of your close friends um, that you feel really comfortable and you can be transparent and talk with them. Um, there is actually a statistic that says that 10% um, or um, bariatric patients who participate in support groups um, are have a 10% lower body mass than those who do not. So it is directly impacting, um, you know, keeping that weight off. So that's why I said, let's let me know when and where those meetings are like because um, I'm all about keeping it off. Um, so that makes a huge difference. Another one of the, um, the bullet points on what to do um, to not regain the weight is, is stop the binge eating before surgery. Um, obviously, if binge eating disorder is something that you experienced as part of your weight gain throughout your life, and you might even, you know, like, that's just a label, but when you think about, it, if you look up what binge eating disorder is, I think there's a lot of people who would be like, well, I never called it that, but that's exactly what I do. 
right? And so, I mean, that's how I was when I was like, oh, I didn't know that there was like BED. Like I didn't know there was this disorder that was out there, but I was like, well, no one ever told me that I had BED, but there were a whole lot of things on the list that I was like, yeah, that fits, you know, like that, that was me. So, um, the other thing that that binge eating does, as we mentioned before, is it can truly like undo the surgery. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can stretch your stomach. You can literally like break it. Mm -hmm. so you get too full. Um, I mean, you can tear um, your stomach, which is major, you know, complications and going back for more surgeries. Um, so the binge eating is, again, it's back to that addiction. Like if you don't address why the binge eating was happening before the surgery, mm -hmm. um, it, those urges to binge eat will not just miraculously go away mm -hmm. just because, you know, you've had surgery and like right. you, your body's losing weight, but your mind is still the same. Go. So let me ask you, Chris, what, what have you done to help you get through those like binge eating impulses and like wanting to binge eat? Well, sometimes I still do. Yeah. To be honest. I mean, I've got my moments where, and, and my binge eating again, like my stomach hasn't stretched completely back okay. to the size of a normal stomach. So it doesn't look the same as someone who could eat, like I couldn't eat a gallon of ice cream, right. um, but I have sat down and eaten so much enough ice cream that was too much where it, you know, would make me sick. And then it was just like, okay, what are we doing here? Um, I have done a lot of personal development in the past, you know, year and a half or so that really is focused on mindset of why am I doing this right now to be able to kind of catch yourself in the moment and redirect, you know, behavior mm -hmm. that kind of comes naturally to you, but you're like, wait, why am I eating so fast? Why am I choosing Oreos over, you know, fruit or, um, so I think that that mindset has, um, so much to do with changing the patterns, changing the behaviors. Um, and, you know, the, not everybody in Live Fully is an isogenics user. A lot of people are. And so I am not afraid to say that um, I, isogenics has truly changed my life, you know, slash saved my life. I mean, the ability to, um, to do a cellular cleanse that kind of you know cleanses out the toxins when I have been eating crappy and it helps my body go back into fat burning mode. Um, having the shakes around that now I crave, just like I craved, you know, other bad for me sweets um, that's gonna be filled with good nutrition like that to me. And in the beginning, I couldn't drink a full shake. Um, my stomach wasn't big enough. So we're, we're going to go through like an isogenic 30 day system in a future zoom and talk about like how to do modifications so that you still can get the products into your body. But it's obviously you're going to have to modify it from, from you know, what the standard instructions are. Um, but now when I drink um, a shake, it's, it's over a course of time. It's not in five, 10 minutes, you know, like it's, it's going to take me a while to get, to get that nutrition in. So whether you kind of break it up and have half of a shake in, you know, in the morning and then half at lunch and then maybe half in the afternoon and short, mm -hmm. that's what I did in the beginning. Um, now if I make a shake, it just takes me a little bit longer, um, you know, to drink it and that's okay. But, um, what about you with the binge? Eating? I, you know, I still am like, you know, I get to a point where like, cause you know, I'm on the go all the time and, and then I just get to that point. I'm just so hungry and I forget to take snacks with me or, you know, like a bar or crackers or something. And, and, and then I just get so hungry and then I just find myself eating so fast and, and then I try to eat whatever I see. And, and, and then I just feel like, horrible afterwards you know you're just sick to your stomach and like you said you run into the bathroom and it's just it's not fun it does not feel good and <laughs> yeah but it, that's a, it's a struggle to try to like keep from do, from binge eating yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but it reminds me like 
it's a lot like um like bulimia because that's what they do they do they binge eat but then they will make themselves get sick and but like I know for me like I don't I won't make myself get sick you know like I just I just eat you know and yeah yeah but especially before surgery like that's how it was and yeah now like because of the surgery like I can't eat so much <laughs> yeah yeah, it's like sometimes I wish, right? Like you go to right. a barbecue, or I mean, somewhere there's all this good food, and it's like, oh, I would love it. Yeah. Like, but, uh, yeah. Um, okay. And then just a couple more of the things, you know, to do to be able to, um, to keep from gaining the weight back. Um, address, we talked about the addiction, address those issues. You, it, it's a must. It's a must, must. The weight will come back because the whole reason why we gained all that weight in the first place was due to some type of emotional underlying issue. And if that doesn't get addressed, it is just a matter of time. Maybe you keep your weight off for two years, three years, four years, five years, but it is going to creep back um, because you'll find another way. Um, and so addressing those issues is huge. Um, Things like positive affirmations that you can say um, out loud and hear yourself say, you know, um, every single day and surrounding yourself with people that know what you're going through. Like, uh, you know, it's like, hey, let's get together. Let's go to this, you know, support thing. Like, there's nothing wrong with that um, when you've got somebody that you need to be able to confide in and that knows um, what you're going through. Another one um, of the... Um, the things to do to keep that weight off is, you know, follow your doctor's advice um, was on there. And the one thing that I'll say about doctors is that oftentimes um, they only know what they know. So a lot of people that want to start isogenics, whether they've had, you know, surgery or not, um, will say, well, I need to check this out with my doctor. And a lot of times the doctors don't have never heard of isogenics. So they say, no, I don't want you to do that. You know, you just stick with this plan that I'm giving you. Um, so what I would say is, um, you know, definitely when it comes to, um, you know, your blood work, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, you know, the things that are common in, in the deficiencies, which are um, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B12, um, you know, iron, anything related to red blood cell um, count. All of those things, like absolutely 1,000% listen to your doctor. But do some due diligence that if you are thinking about um, using a nutritional product, um, and maybe Isogenics is, is one of those things that you want to use, do some comparing. If they've recommended a protein shake, and maybe it's something like Ensure, or you know maybe it's some other type of protein, look at what's on the label. Compare them. Because... The doctor may have never heard of isogenics, and so they're afraid to actually say, like, yes, I approve that, or I think it's okay for you to use it, when in actuality, if you put them side by side, there might be a really good chance that you're like, hey, you know, the doctor's like, this, this looks like a pretty good product, right? So don't be afraid to take it in. I mean, take the products in and say, hey, can you look at this? You prescribe this protein shake for me. This is the one, you know, that a friend of mine has had some great success with. Like, what do you think? So I'm all for following doctor's advice, provided the doctor is aware, right? Like they might be making a decision that's, that, they, that they don't really know what's in our products either. So um, definitely want to do that. Um, and the very last thing um, that I wanted to mention too, as far as, you know, preventing the weight from coming back is um, one of the books that I read, um, and the, the very first Live Fully Zoom, um, this was part of the presentation, I think, Allison, you probably were on that and remember it, Brene Brown uh, wrote a book called The Gifts of Imperfection, and I personally found so much symmetry between what she had to say about um, uh, self-love and compassion and belonging and um, a deservingness of um, loving ourselves as well as receiving love from other people, that there, it was a profound book for me related to um, 
this mindset, this idea of um, I'm not panicked about weight anymore because I know that that's not who I am, right? The weight, the body that we're in is a result of choices that we've made because of experiences that we've gone through. So we've chosen to overeat. Some people are alcoholics because they've gone through situations and they've chosen to drink, you know, and then, and I mean, there's a whole nother thing behind alcoholism, but, um, you know, drug addiction, same thing. Like, this is not who you are. Like, we are spiritual beings that are living inside of a physical body. And Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection, um, for me, was so pivotal in me understanding that like, that, that's just not who I am, right? That was the body that I was living in because of the choices that I was making. But that, that's not who, who Chris Drabenstadt is, like as a spiritual being. And it was like, once I got that and I started to learn, and it wasn't like snap the light switch goes off, like now I get it, it's a process. But her book was gigantic for me to have some of those ahas of I deserve to be in a healthy body. I deserve to make good choices and not destructive choices, you know, like not like this moving from one addiction to the next. Like I deserve to have that brought to the forefront of my mind and, and, and notice when I'm like, wait, I think I'm doing this again, right? It might not be food this time, but now it's something else. And so um, I just think her book has been, it, it, was, it was really helpful for me to learn more about my um, deservingness and, you know, like compassion for myself. Um, and so that may, it may or may not resonate with you, but, um, you know, if you're watching this recording and, you know, you're looking for something to, um, to read and you're feeling, you know, like you, you kind of can't break through some of these issues that are related to um, severe obesity, whether you've had bariatric surgery or not, I would highly recommend that book. Um, so that was all that I had for um, tonight's Zoom. I just, um, I'm going to post it in a couple of different groups because I know that I've had a, a lot of conversations recently with people that are, um, and, and maybe it's not you, but maybe you do isogenics as a business and you coach people um, who are either thinking about having surgery or um, have had surgery and are going through this issue of regaining weight and you know, how can they implement um, isogenics nutrition into their lives, um, you know, to counteract that. And so hopefully this Zoom was helpful in, in helping people to see, you know, why we're gaining weight after, after surgery and then, you know, what some of the, um, what some of the things are that we can do to try to, you know, prevent that. Um, so there's, there's nutrition and there's mindset. I mean, it's like, that's it. You know, like it's getting the right nutrition in your body. Um, and then there's having the behaviors around choosing that nutrition over, um, you know, things that we've chosen in the past that have caused us to be overweight. Um, any final parting thoughts from Allison or Gerald before we go? No. Gerald says no. No, no. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you guys for um, jumping on. And uh, it looks like we lost our, our Aussies that were on here. But make sure that you tune in um, next week. Um, it will be Thursday late afternoon. I'll post all the details, the time, and the Zoom um, this upcoming Thursday, which I believe is the 20th. Um, and it's actually in Australia. That will be their Friday morning. So it'll be probably seven, seven o'clock in the morning, seven, eight o'clock in the morning for them in Australia. But they're going to have a group of them. Um, so I hear that are going to be logging on to Live Fully. And they have their own um, group there of 100 pound club. Um, 
people in isogenics in um, Sydney, Australia, and they get together and they've, they've got their own thing going. And uh, I said, you know what, we should really come together and, and bring Live Fully together with their group. And so hopefully, um, you know, Leon, um, who was on the call earlier, um, his last name I struggle with, it's actually spelled T-O, and then there's apostrophe O. So it's like Oh, um, but I'm sure he'll do it much better than I did it. Um, so he's agreed to, to guest and, and tell his story and he's going to be bringing some of his, his Aussie friends. So I'm super excited for that. And I'll be posting in the groups about his guesting for next week too. So, um, Allison, thank you so much for your chatting and helping us understand, you know, about your experience too, with the bypass and the sleeve. Um, <laughs> And uh, that's all I have for tonight, guys. So thank you for everybody that goes back and watches this recording. And please feel free to share it out with anyone that you might know um, in your family or any friends that uh, might be able to benefit from, um, from this information about bariatric surgery. So hope everybody has a good night and uh, peace out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, bye guys. Bye. bye.